So I'm currently working on a project that explores the career returns to visibility. Uh, now what I mean by that is that in certain jobs we have this vague sense that uh, for an employee to advance they need to make their name known. So whether that's through self-promotion or through taking advantage of opportunities to display their talents to other people. Um, so I explore these ideas in the context of British politics where there's institutional rules that give exogenous variation in the visibility of politicians. So some politicians might be randomly selected to give a speech in Parliament, whereas other politicians randomly miss out on that opportunity. Uh, now what I can then do is I can link these opportunities to the career paths of these politicians and I can test for both the short-term and the long-term effects of visibility on career outcomes. And I can also look at whether these effects of visibility differ for different groups. So to take one example, we might think that the effects of visibility would be different for men and women. Um, and if that's the case, then this helps us understand a bit better the gender differences or the sources of gender differences um, in career outcomes. Um, so I think one paper that's had a real influence on me was uh, Gautam Rao's job market paper on the integration of rich and poor students in Delhi schools. So what he finds in that paper is that when rich students are exposed to poor students, they become much more pro-social. Uh, but to me, what was the really interesting thing about this paper was the creativity and how Gautam measured the outcomes. So to take one example, um, Gautam organized relay races and then he had these rich students pick whether their partner for the relay race should be a rich student like themselves um, or a poor student. And he used this measure uh, to get at taste-based discrimination. Uh, now to me this is a really nice example of a third way of measurement other than lab measurement um, and field measurement. Um, and so the lesson for me is that when we're in this, this context, which we are often in, where there doesn't exist a natural field measure of the concept we're interested in, and when we want more naturalism than we would typically find in the lab, then we can create these new measures that blend these two approaches of the lab and the field. So I think behavioral economists have this rich history of studying and documenting uh, both behavioral biases and different types of preferences and incorporating these things into economic analysis. Uh, but what I think remains a much more open question is where do these biases and preferences actually come from? Um, so to take one example, behavioral economists have studied a lot social preferences, but I think we still don't really know whether there are government policies that can mold how other regarding our preferences are. And I think we don't know much about how the environments that we grow up in and that we work in affect the, the preferences, these social preferences we have. Um, now, I think one way of getting at these types of questions would be to um, explicitly ask um, how, to what extent do we absorb the preferences um, and the values of the people that we live and work around and the culture that we're in. Um, and second, how does this absorption depend on how old we are? So I think we frequently state this conventional wisdom that adults are much less malleable than children. But I think my view would be that actually to answer that question, we need a type of experiment which does not really exist, or at least has not really been run. So this is where I think we could do with more research. My name is Matt Lowe and I'm a postdoc at Brick. 